this is about you. The infinite you. The part of you that can't be seen, can't be smelled, touched, or tasted. But you know you feel it. Who you really are. In a world lost to confusion, a universe that's partly illusion, when we look for meaning, we often simply find more delusion. Ground your consciousness in the sounds of the universe, a podcast about your true omnipotence. There's a universe inside each of us, but our beliefs keep us constrained to the edges of what we can imagine. The Innerverse Podcast is your portal to that infinite realm of ideas. I'm Chance Garden, and I'll be your host as we serve up inspirational sound waves from the brightest minds with the highest vibes. And we keep searching for the empowering perspectives we need to create our greatest masterpiece of all, our lives. What's up? Welcome to the one within all. And thank you for taking another mental trip to the universe. I'm Chance and I hope you're going to agree with me that life is the biggest gift and it keeps on giving. Whether or not you rolled your eyes at that and thought, well, sure, life keeps giving me problems. I can totally assure you that after this episode, you're going to have a better perspective about life's pitfalls and realize there are actually moments of loving education from the great universal consciousness of which you are a reflection. Our guest today is Nancy Byrne, and she is no stranger to taking some unexpected hits from on high. She's used her experience with seemingly irredeemable hardships in life to initiate herself into a path of intuitive healing, writing, speaking, and living, and with that she helps others learn to trust themselves by her example. I recently read Nancy's book called Choices, a soul-touching memoir that mixes humor and compassion into a life story where she deals with horrific suffering far beyond the scope of what's natural. Nancy discovered the ways in which she was perpetuating her own problems by her flawed beliefs and the suppression of the still small voice within, and it's a really great and inspirational book. Just what the still small voice within that we all carry might be how we can learn to count on it. These are the subjects of today's chat, and I'm sure we'll get into the nitty-gritty of some of the crazier things that Nancy has heroically endured in her life. And best of all, we are sure to laugh, grin, and have an all-around groovy time as we get to know this witty and wonderful, whimsical writer. And I do hope you check the show notes for links to her book, which you can find on Amazon. Choices is a quick read, and it will stick with you way longer than the time it takes to absorb. And as Nancy says on her website, anyone who has survived a less than optimal childhood, an abusive relationship, or who just experiences a lack of confidence could reap tremendous benefits from this book when they realize that they have choices available to them in the shaping of the course of their lives. Her website is choices-nlb.com, and you can find more info about the book in the other offerings Nancy provides right there. Before we bounce off the diving board into the deep end of the universe with Nancy Byrne, since we're talking about spirit and intuition, it would make sense to tune our mental instruments to get a better signal from source consciousness. (laughs) The fact that we feel we must ask or have permission or do some special ritual to access our own natural power is proof that we have been living in a disconnected state. Shifting from off to on again is as natural as breathing, but when we feel stuck in the off mode, it can seem like time is creeping up on us. That's because on means light, 
and the light of truth shines on the present moment only. The past is a specter, and the future is only an idea. The quantum particle field that makes up our substrate reality has been proven to react to our thoughts and intentions, but more than that, we have learned that observation is the primary portal that transforms potential energy, the wave, into manifest form, that is, the particle. How many padlocks are between you and the present moment? There are so many outcomes we fear and experiences we regret that we isolate ourselves from the energy of truth. The act of asking for love, energy, protection, or any other quality of harmony, these requests are the keys to the breaker box. We have to open the box and look inside it to know if we've blown a fuse. If we need to flip the breaker or make repairs, we may hesitate because that switch will put the lights out temporarily while we plunge into the heart of the problem to repair it. And what of the asking for help part? Is it God, creator, higher self, a guardian angel, or some kind of alien fairy creature that you're asking? Who knows? But the point of asking is in looking for the reply. When you ask for blessings from the forces of universal goodness, and most importantly, you pay attention by shining your flashlight of imagination within, you may feel an emotional or energetic movement inside yourself. If you don't, try to imagine what it would feel like to be bathed in the warm light of supreme loving kindness. Once you make a feeling-based connection to your intention for your highest good, you have succeeded in collapsing a wave of potential energy into a singularity of self-love. This is solar power. This is green energy because it comes from your heart. And the heart chakra, by the way, is green colored. This is the ultimate free and renewable power source, asking yourself for love. The more you ask for, the more you get. Do you need more than just love, but wisdom too? If you make an imagination link to your divine power, you can try automatic writing, speaking, singing, or divination arts like tarot and I Ching. Just see what comes out. You might be surprised by answering much more than the initial question that you pose to self. But of course, you will have already known the answer. Now you just know that you know that you know. <laughs> so now let's get to know our new friend Nancy Byrne, who you should welcome to the show with a shower of interdimensional love glitter that we can all shoot from our astral fingertips in her general direction. Whether or not you did all that, thanks for tuning in, everybody, and welcome to the Innerverse, Nancy. Thank you, Chance. Thank you for having me on your show. Yes, it's a great honor. I definitely enjoyed your book, like I said, and I'm looking forward to hearing more about what you actually do these days besides uh, authorship, because as I was checking out your website, I saw you had quite a few services. So why don't you tell us kind of a little bit about modern day, current Nancy Byrne, where you're at, what you do, and then we'll kind of Quentin Tarantino things and take things back to the beginning. Well, I do. Um, I do a lot of psychic readings from my webpage and spirit told me that I needed to write another book and the title was going to be remembering. So of course I put the cart before the horse and I started writing and I got, I got a few tidbits from spirit, but it wasn't like the first book where practically spirit wrote the whole book. And it was kind of hard for me to, it was just a, what didn't seem to be flowing. It didn't seem to mesh as things would happen. Jennifer, again, that amazing manager I have, got me this talk on this show that's about children that have been raped, adult survivors of, of, of rape. And I did not want to be on it. I just, no, no, no. It just seems so negative and so horrific to me. And I, and I feel like my purpose is to uplift people and empower them. And then I went to bed and I dreamt about this all night long. I remembered about my own sexual abuse and I remembered how terrified I was and how awful it was and, and how scared I was. And I just, so now, you know, I, I was remembering all this stuff and I thought that's why spirit gave me the title of remembering. Sometimes we remember, have to remember what we've been through so that we can rise above it and finally remember who we really are in our core and the magnificent things that we can do and the amazing people that we are and how much we have to offer because of our life's experiences. And I think that that's 
Spirit's message, the whole, you know, throughout all of this is remembering who we really are, not what society has told us, not what religion religious dogma tries to put on us, not what the government tries to impose on us. Nothing. We we live most of our lives supporting and defending values that aren't even our own. They were put on us when we were first born. You know, our, our race, our, our gender, our socioeconomic group that we're born into, everything. We didn't choose that. You know, I mean, because we, we made a contract to, to join the family we're in, but this doesn't have to be our life. It's just what we fell into to grow and to become the people we are. And we think that this is us. You know, these are our values because these are our family's values. Even in work, you hear people saying, well, my father was good enough for my father. It's good enough for me. Most people never move from where they were born, their hometown, and they never stretch themselves out. They never think about on their own. They just listen to what everyone else tells them to believe. And what's right for them. And when we get terrified, we have this tendency to, to grasp at straws and try to listen, get everybody else's advice. And the most important thing we can do is go within. It's all the answers are there. They're always there. Well, yeah, you just kick things off with the perfect description of the entire show's message on Interverse Podcast, which is the answers are all there within. I guess I'll start with responding to what you're talking about with remembering, because I actually have a similar experience where early in my sort of spiritual journey, I guess, or self-discovery journey, once I was actually kind of on such a journey, although maybe at that time I hadn't realized it, one of the things that really kicked it off was actually a psychedelic experience. But in that psychedelic experience, I found myself remembering a childhood abuse that I had totally forgotten about and compartmentalized and like spent most of my teenage years and early 20s not aware that it had even happened. So that was weird. And it came back on kind of all in a flood. And then it's not even been something that could be processed or pieced together all at once right then and there. But I think I got a bunch of my personal energy back just by breaking down that wall. Because when we compartmentalize our negative memories and traumas and keep them at bay, it's actually a sort of energy in our body that's having to be maintained to keep up that barrier between us and that experience. And if we can just accept the experience and love ourselves, even though we've gone through it, and even better yet, recognize the potential for empowerment because we have had the hardship, then we get that energy back. We're no longer spending it all just on maintaining a force field that is costly and and not good. And then, you know, your personality is kind of fragmented in that sense, too. You don't have access to the fullness of who you are. And I don't think that any of our experiences are completely outside of our choice. It's even though in our life, we maybe see it only as having happened because someone else chose to do it to us. But we don't know the relationship we have with that person beyond this particular part of life and, uh, you know, our current incarnation. So... <laughs> You've got to be really thinking a lot quite off the bat. And I, I love everything you've been saying. Or did you go through with it and go be on that panel on that show? I, I missed that. Yes, yes. I, well, I, it, it's not on yet, but I'm going to be on the show. I agreed to be on the show. And, you know, I've glazed over the fact in some radio shows that I was raped by my dad. But I never really talked about it. You know, I think that people have to know some of the some of the feelings and the emotions that play out so that they know they're not all alone and, and that it's normal. And, you know, Chance, when you said you realized you finally, you remembered, you know, you're, you don't remember until you're strong enough to handle it. And then you remember. So when you do remember, that means you can handle it. It's not always easy, but you're, you're strong enough to take it on. I, had repressed all of my memories. I really didn't remember at all. I just, I've always felt, you know, kind of useless and worthless. And well, and I was told as a child that I was unlovable and I was always the black sheep, but you, you just, you don't know why you have those feelings. I mean, I just thought my parents were right, but you know, it does affect you. And there's a lot of, you know, a lot of just depression and denial until you're ready to, to figure it out. And I happened to be in grad school <laughs> to become a clinical psychologist. And I remember thinking, oh, God, I don't know what's happening to me. No wonder I want to be a shrink. I'm crazy. <laughs> you know? And 
just thinking that it was um it was a really weird experience and for about about three or four months, I honestly thought I was going to lose my mind. It was just weird. I, first of all, I started, I went to the dentist and I had a full blown panic attack and I had been going to this dentist forever, but I could feel the closeness of his face and his breath next to me. And before I knew it, I had jumped out of the chair and I was in a corner like a terrified animal and my heart, I could, it seemed like I thought he could see my heart and I was just, it's, it's not. You, it's 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 me. I, I don't know what's the matter with me. And he said, maybe you want to go sit in the lobby for a minute. And I thought, BS, I'm getting out of this place. And he was on the third floor, and I literally jumped down each flight of stairs. I was just panicking to get out of there. It was like somebody was chasing me and going to kill me. And at the last flight, I fell and I hit my nose. I thought I broke my nose. And there was blood, but of course I was bleeding from the from the dental work, you know. Uh, he had been drilling and he wasn't finished. And I ran around that parking lot and I ran and ran until I couldn't run anymore. And I just collapsed on the curb and I was crying and I didn't know what was going on with me. And then after that, um, I started having dreams about having sex with my dad. And I thought, oh, God. What a sick person who does that. I mean, my God, what's the matter with me, Nancy? You know, and um, it was just really awful. And then I remember there was a point where it was like my head was in the corner and one leg was down by the floor and another arm. And that's the way I, I felt. It was like I was just my body was all disjointed. I was separated and, and I couldn't. It took a long time to get those pieces together before I realized what was going on, you know, and. And then I went to see a, um, a Freudian psychotherapist, and that was a, a really good experience because I, you know, I already felt like I was a freak. And he sat in his desk, and I had to sit like clear in a chair on the other end of the room, like he didn't want to even be close to me. And then he asked me a question, and he said, "If you had to pick between one of Mercedes Benz in your garage, or the feeling that it." you get one from helping people, which would you choose? And I said, oh, the feeling you get from helping people, of course, because it lasts forever. And he started to cry and he left the room. And I thought, oh, my God, I even made a shriek cry. I'm really a freak. I mean, so all these experiences that people go through and, and sometimes you're the one. It's people think it's you. You know what? There's nothing voluptuous about a three-year-old little girl. Nothing. You know, it's not, it wasn't your fault. I think that before we're even born, we join, we, we make contracts with other people because we have to learn lessons. And my astrology chart says that I was born into a minefield because I never knew how to take care of myself. I was always kind of put on a pedestal. I was always the wise man that gave people advice and people would come and bring me food and clothes. And I never really worked. I never had to really face a lot of adversity. And I had to learn that I was strong enough to face whatever it was I needed to face. And and I I am incredibly strong. I mean, I, you know, it's just amazing what we learn from every experience, no matter how horrendous it seems, it has a purpose. And I, honest and truly, am grateful for every single experience that I've been through. Not at the time. I wouldn't want to go through and relive them, that's for sure. And I wouldn't wish them on anybody else. But I am really, really happy for the experiences because they've made me who I am today. And they've given me a compassion for other people that I may not have ever had. My astrology says that I'm kind of like an empath when it comes to people's feelings and emotions. I'll just say that my particular type of psychicness is really resonating with your message. I feel it in my heart so strongly that you are grateful and it is powerful because if people even knew some of the stuff that you described in the book, let alone the things that you didn't share, that you held back for yourself to process on your own, then it would be quite impressive to have even a shred of gratitude. And of course, it's all about the perspective and the decision and the choice. And I think that it's cool that you are really aware of the fact that these contracts 
most likely do exist because the mechanical nature of the universe is actually a free will system. It's not, it's not really based on randomness or determinism in any way. It's all free will everywhere you go up and down the spectrum. So realizing that it is the most empowering thing because even the people that have done really wrong to us in this life, we don't have to judge their heart or their soul. We can, you know, we can have discernment or judgment against that type of behavior or action. We can know that they're not good for us to be around and not be around them, but we don't have to hate them. We don't have to hold on to feelings of regret that all these things even went down in the first place. We can just carry forward with our lessons and you've definitely, you're definitely a far more beautiful and radiant person than the average. And I love how well you articulate yourself and it's been already a great first couple of minutes of show. And I have so many questions for you. Your shrink that you saw, the Freudian guy, you know, he didn't really react well to you, it sounds like. What would you say about the idea that before anyone can really even be a healer, that they must heal themselves, actually? I agree 100% with that, you know, and I think that that's why so many, so many of us go into the healing profession sometimes because it's... um. You feel like you're doing something useful and you're contributing and you're helping other people because you can't help yourself. And also when you're focusing on other people's problems and trying to help them through them, you don't have to focus on your own. And I have done so many public presentations where I would say as many as a half or three fourths of the audience are therapists. And they're really frustrated that they don't feel, they feel that their hands are tied. There are so many rules and regulations and you classify people. You know, once you're classified, you're classified. <laughs> and, you know, they just, they have to, if somebody says that, you know, they're going to commit suicide, you have to report them and get them help. And more and more people are having a different view that they're not really able to give all that they want to give and, and give the help that people truly need. You know, we were given free will and we get to exercise it. Whether anyone thinks it's right for us or not, we were given free will. And I think that, you know, choosing, I wouldn't do it. I, hopefully I would never do it. I, 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 you know, it's sad when somebody feels so hopeless and desperate that they want to do it. But I can see, I don't know, suicide or taking the pill when you think that, like, if you have a terminal disease and you just can't suffer anymore. When I worked for the police department, there was this really sad, but it touched my heart. Older couple and his wife was dying from, from throat cancer. She couldn't eat and she couldn't breathe and she was choking. And she'd been going on for so long. And she asked her husband to please, please help help her die and so he had taken all the money out of the bank and put it in the car in the trunk of the car for the son that signed over the house and everything to their son and they called and left a message on their son's phone that it had nothing to do with him they really loved him but his mom was suffering so incredibly and he could not stand to watch her suffer anymore and she'd asked him to please you know shoot her and and her misery that that was the kindest thing he could do and he loved her and was going to listen to her last request and then he said of course I can't live without your mother so I'm going to kill myself and the police found them in the basement they had put up little sleeping bags in the basement so they wouldn't get blood or make a mess and he had shot her put his arm under her lay next to her and shot himself people might think that's horrible and I know some religions would think I'm a horrible person for saying this, but I think that we have rules that we make up of how people must live their lives and how they must adhere to certain standards and stuff, and it doesn't apply for everybody. What's worked for me in my life may not help other people. I don't have the only true answers. I don't believe in an only true church or an only true method. I believe that all paths lead to the center and then we're all connected and whatever we do to one we do to the others you know and it just people need to make their own choices and we need to follow that inner guidance within us there's some things that i would never do because i'm just repressed i wish i wasn't but that's part of who i am but i admire some of my friends that are just 
freer. I mean, they just, I wish that I could just be, well, I don't wish that because that's not my personality and it wouldn't work for me, but I admire their spontaneity. They get up and and they go if they want to go someplace. They just do whatever they want. They don't stick with the job forever and ever and ever and ever, a boring, endless job, which I have done. Well, I know what you mean, totally, because I have friends that are out traveling the world and there's a part of me that it admires that so much and would like to be doing that. But then there's part of me that knows, actually, you have responsibilities that you have already chosen. And you also have a mission that is really important. Things that you are doing here now that aren't involving traveling. And then later, you might travel a lot. But just it doesn't all have to be right now, I guess, is what I want to interject with, uh, including even this lifetime. You have uh, you have. Infinity, right? <laughs> What's the big rush? <laughs> My husband was just talking to me about that today because I get obsessed with stuff. You know, when Spirit told me to write choices, I wrote it in like two and a half weeks. And I just, you know, well, Spirit wrote it, so it wasn't a big deal. You know, I just did the automatic writing. But And now, you know, that I'm thinking about remembering, I'm like, oh, my God, this is the, where it's supposed to be. And I just want to get it out so people can have it. And as Bill said, remember the automatic writing you wrote yesterday where Spirit told you that time is just a blink of an eye. Although it seems like it may go on and on and on for us, it's really just a blink of an eye. You don't have to get so obsessed and do everything right now, Nancy. (laughs) And I do. I have a tendency to, you know, I've got to get this done. What if something happens and I don't finish it and and nobody ever gets to to find out the stuff? Well, I, I really believe that there is a higher power that we're connected to, that we're part of. You know, our souls know the time. Our souls know everything. We know everything. Chance, you know, how can you possibly, this freaked me out when I started doing readings. How can you possibly know what in the heck is going on with somebody in Canada or California or Texas or the UK when you don't even, you never talk to them? How can you possibly know? And I Because I was born and raised in the Catholic Church, and I thought, oh, my God, this is the devil. This is some demonic spirit. What did I hook into? Oh, God, you know, it's because I'm a bad person because I had sex with my dad. We, we, we We blame ourselves for everything. We're so hard on ourselves. I mean, I don't know. I just feel this about you, but we want to help other people. We're forgiving. You make allowances for other people because they're just human. But we never do that to ourselves. We are the greatest critics we could ever have of ourselves. I mean, my God, no one has to criticize me or berate me because no one can do it as well as I can and as often as I can. And I kind of think that lots of times empaths and sensitive people and, and people that connect with spirit, I sometimes think we have that tendency a little bit more, you know, than other people. So I don't know. What do you think about that? Well, it's something that I had to learn to stop doing as far as beating myself up for stuff. I still have a big tendency, like we were talking about a minute ago, rush, rush, rush. And I often feel like I don't have very much time in a day because I plan to do 10 things when in reality, I could maybe do three, two of those things possibly and actually do it (laughs) in a healthy and balanced way. And I, I really like what I've learned from my friend, Yura Soul, who's on a couple episodes back, where he talks about balance being just realizing when something in your life is overpowering something else in your life. And so if you are being overpowered by the feeling that you don't have enough time, maybe you just need to plan to do fewer things and then you won't feel that way. Then you'll feel like you had all the time in the world. <laughs> but in, in general, biting off less than what you think you could possibly do. Like the 70% rule, that's always really good. And when it comes to us empaths beating ourselves up for not accomplishing this or that, or for for something being our fault that is going wrong in the world because of some connection to uh, some emotional blockage that we're, we're carrying around, you know, that is a big deal. Luckily for me through the meditation practice, though, I was able to get a big handle, an easy jug sized handle that I can always grab on my perspective whenever I start beating myself up in any capacity or some kind of negative self-talk happens. I pretty much always just notice it and go, oh, I don't really think that about myself or oh, it's probably okay. 
And so like an example on the time thing, to prepare for this episode, I, I usually write out some questions. I write out an intro. I get all my audio levels figured out. And I try to get myself in the zone, maybe meditate for a minute, do some qigong. But right before this episode was like, before this conversation was about to start, one of my cats got outside where we thought. And so I'm walking around in a super cold, wet, <laughs> rainy. Uh, no, I had no shoes on because I was just trying to find this cat before he got far. And I easily could have started like going, oh, crap, I'm not going to have enough time to get ready for the show. This isn't good. This isn't going to work. Uh, no, stupid cat. I could have like I saw that that vibration was there as a thought. And instead, I was just like, uh, no, probably going to find the cat in enough time. Even if I don't write more questions than I've already got, it's going to be OK. Even if I have to improv and maybe even re-record the intro later, it's going to be fine. It'll be all right. And then, of course, we found the cat was not even outside. <laughs> <laughs> And the upside was I walked around with my shoes off and got some grounding from the earth, even though it was really cold. But hey, it woke me up too. So all around, it was great that it happened. I had plenty of time to prepare for the show and uh, everything was good and I never beat myself up. So this is something maybe it's kind of new for me to even be able to achieve that. And it used to have, I would have definitely gotten like stressed out in the past, heart rate up, you know. <laughs> so yeah, I, I definitely feel what you're saying. Going easy on ourselves is a great way to just make everything easier. And why not? Because there's already plenty of stuff that's challenging in life. You know, and people say they don't have time to meditate. And I think we don't have time not to meditate. I get so much. I actually end up doing so much more when I do spend the time for myself to go within and it's just it's just like a I don't know, a vitamin shot or something. It's just amazing. You just you do have more energy, you can think clearer, more clearly. And it's something that I, I really try to do. And also, you know, I counseled people, I do astrology, I do readings, and I don't practice sometimes any of this stuff for myself. And so whenever there's any kind of a decision that needs to be made, I don't care how much pressure is being put on me to make it, I always do. I always check in. I do an automatic writing and it's always right. You know, you always make the right decisions when you take time to look within yourself. And so that's just what I, a practice I just started recently is just always checking in because I think it's great when people ask the questions about life decisions and, you know, big, huge, impactful things and they want to find out. And, you know, I haven't really done that for myself on a regular basis. And so now I'm doing it. My husband had a huge kind of crisis come up and um, he asked me to do the writing and I couldn't believe it. It specified like, you know, do this, do this and do this. And Phil was just like, I, I, that's unreasonable. I can't, I, you know, I, I that's, that's not, I'm, I, I think I'm, and he did exactly what, he, what the writing said and, you know, it worked out perfectly. And I mean, now he's a real believer. <laughs> 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 I think that is awesome. Good for Phil for listening to that voice because it's the same voice in all of us. When I was talking earlier about the body intelligence in the intro, this is like the idea that your body is the temple of God. In the Christian book of Genesis, there's the phrase that we're created in God's image, or you can say we're created in the universe's image, or the totality is within us. There's a lot of ways of saying it, but either way, if that's the case and that and you're listening to how it feels using your emotional intelligence and letting that give you intuitive thoughts on what to do for yourself or even drawing a literal voice out of yourself and uh, hearing that in the past, I think our ancestors would not have been afraid to say that they heard the voice of God, you know, and we call it spirit. We call it God. We call it higher self. We call it guardian angel. Well, I don't care what you call it. It can just be your body's intelligence for all I care. It's all just symbol structures describing the same thing, which is the source of yourself is something you can tap into and listen to. So one way I like to do it besides automatic writing, which I don't really do all that much, but my way is a lot goofier, but it's fun, is I'll listen to some kind of like electronic hip hop music without lyrics and I'll like freestyle rap or sing to myself. And I will tell myself shit that I need to hear right then. And it works. It really works. And I'll, I'll notice too, if I'm really focused on something that's blocking me or I'm kind of in like an addictive pattern of behavior, I won't even be able to get it going. 
And so then I'll know exactly, but I'll know intuitively why that is too. So it, it's interesting. It all it connects well with like the, uh, I can always use that as a way to know whether my throat chakra or my fifth chakra is really working well. And yeah, today is a big day emphasizing that for me, I've got a lot of blue in my reality. So I think using intentions can help open that stuff up as well. And uh, I'm doing that because of course, blue and the throat chakra is the communication and it also related to healing. I thought, well, you're a writer and we're talking about healing from, from traumas and stuff. So yeah, it's a, it's a very blue day. And so little things like that are ways that you can sort of boost your own signal. It's not like these gifts are given to just a, an elite few or somebody that's special. They're given to all of us. We all have them. You know, we might have different gifts. I do automatic writing. You do other other things to heal people and to help. And you have a radio show that reaches so many people. You know, I just we we all have our own little specialization, but we all have been given gifts. And to me, it's kind of a responsibility to use them you know if somebody gives you a gift and you just throw it back in their face I mean that's not being very appreciative and I loved your intro where you said we've all been given the gift of life because that is the greatest gift anyone could ever be given it is such an amazing gift and when you think about these bodies yeah sometimes they ache and sometimes things happen or you shatter your knee or whatever happens but you know we are the only machine that can keep going our hearts can beat for over a hundred years you know without having to take it in without having to start it or wind it up or there is no motor you know made so far that you should I, thank your heart for that yes and i mean it just it goes on and on it's, it's incredible our bodies are incredible and the way they can heal themselves and and we talk a lot sometimes about the right things to eat and right. But you know, nourishment is, I think, everything you take into your body. And the vibes, the people you associate with, you know, the movie shows you watch, everything that you let into your body comes in and it's part of what either nourishes you or causes you problems. I I can't anymore like watch horror movies or violence on TV. It just, I can't sleep one night my husband and I had rented on Netflix what was it something hours or something because it was about authors and so Phil thought I'd be interested in it it was about Sylvia Plath and all these authors that had committed suicide and everything and it was just oh to me it was so kind of depressing and and that people would just have so much to give and, and not realize it and be loved so much and not realize it and just throw their lives away. And I could not sleep. I felt almost suicidal myself, you know, because I let that energy in. So we choose what to let in and we can choose not to let negativity and things that hurt us into our zone. And I think we need to make wiser choices sometimes to think things through, not always be a yes person and be so eager to please everybody else. Okay, we'll try. Okay, I'll do it. I don't want to hurt your feelings. So yes, just no, this is your life and it's yours. So you get to make the choices. If you listen to somebody, if you, if you listen to me and I tell you to do something and it's the wrong decision, I'm not going to be impacted by it. You are. You're going to suffer the consequences, not me. And if I tell you the right thing and, and you do it, you know, you're going to be the one that reaps the rewards. You have to make your own decisions because the choices you make, you know, are going to impact the rest of your life. And so no matter if you're up or down, really just think about them. Don't be in a rush and don't let anybody try to push you into making a decision that you don't feel comfortable making at the moment because only you, only you have the right answers and know what's right for you. And even a therapist, they only know what you tell them. I mean, so if you're just telling them about the negative aspects and this and this and that, you know, they don't know the whole picture. I had a lady come into me one time and tell me these horrible stories about her husband she was planning on getting a divorce and setting him up to take all his money and she wanted me to be able to talk about how cruel he was and he was not it was her so 
Just because somebody tells you a story doesn't mean it's true. You know, don't judge another person because somebody else judges another person. You make that decision for yourself. Wow, that's really, really good advice. And I think it is extremely important to remember that everything we're taking in, information, entertainment, food, everything is all part of what nourishes us or develops us in one way or another. Like I, I, I've been thinking a lot lately how <laughs> I still really like to play video games and because it's pretend, even though there's like oftentimes some element of violence in all games, pretty much, uh, even though it's pretend, that's still sort of like an idea that's going into me, even though I know that I have a barrier against that in a way that I would never behave like, you know, a video game character would behave or, or fight people. It's just weird. And maybe it's the Mars 10th house placement in my birth chart that makes me even attracted to that type of a thing. But I also know I could choose a different outlet for that exact type of energy in the form of something healthy like martial arts. And I do plan on on doing that and making that type of uh, behavior modification. But like you said, you know when the right time is. And sometimes you have to handle what you what's on your plate and get into a good flow and routine with that stuff that's foundational before you can move on to other stuff. You know, and there's no need to go be able to take a class in any one thing to also improve your health in that department either. I'm going to have to try to take my own advice and keep that in mind. Well, man, we're coming into the last like 15 minutes of the free show, and I already am uh, thinking. I wish that everybody could hear the plus extension because there's plenty of questions specifically about some of your experiences that I want to get into. So let's go ahead and pick one of those experiences and talk about it. Specifically, I want to know about the killer grape because we're talking about slowing down and talking about being in a rush earlier. And I think this story really does in a very graphic way demonstrate exactly what it means to need to do these practices for yourself before you're ready to do them for other people. And (laughs) why did you elaborate on the killer grape? Could you just, I I know this sounds crazy, but there were so many examples in my book and I've been on so many radio shows and stuff that, could you remind me what that, just tell me a little (laughs) bit about what. Yeah. There's a story in your book about when you were, I believe at some sort of an event or, or conference trying to get somewhere quickly and you wound up, slipping on a grape that was on the floor and your knee basically exploded out of your body. Yes. <laughs> okay. How could I forget the killer? I was going to say, whoa. <laughs> uh, well, because I wrote another thing about skiing and I had a bad accident with skiing too, you know, trying to please somebody else. But yeah, I was supposed to be on this panel. I wanted to stop and I was out of organic virgin olive oil and I wanted to take some uh, gluten-free crackers because they always had a lot of things out but I was trying to just you know not eat as much sugar as starches and all that and so I, I went into a health food store and I wasn't even in the you know the fruit or the vegetable section I was just trying to find the, the rice crackers and I slipped it felt like a grape and I it just in my mind it felt like a grape but I and my feet went out from under me and I did a flip and came down on my knees and it just shattered my knee and my first thought was oh my god how embarrassing and I tried to get up and when I rolled over and saw my the bone protruding through my through my jeans it was like I knew there was no way I was going to be able to get up again. And then the ambulance came and and I started hyperventilating. And I told my husband I needed a, my husband had been waiting outside for me. And when I fell, I asked the lady to please tell my husband. And he came in and I said, I need a bag because I'm hyperventilating. He was asking the man for a bag and the man goes and gets a plastic bag, you know, and they're supposed to be not have plastic bags in this store. It's all paper. (laughs) I was just thinking it was just so crazy. And I don't know, it's just things sometimes things do happen I don't know why they happen I never made it of course to the and then I was all worried about oh my god they're going to think I just didn't show up and I'm unreliable you know there I was on a stretcher worrying about everybody else and yes that's exactly why I wanted you to relive this I and thank you for reliving it because I know it's not exactly like the most fun memory to put yourself back into 
we, we, you know, we all do that, though. We just get so, you know, I had a, another incident that I wrote about in the book where we're skiing and we were with some another couple who were elders with the church. Elders are perfect, <laughs> I thought. I forget that we're all human beings, you know, but we set ourselves up sometimes to be these great gurus who are perfect. And no one is. There's no one who's perfect. I mean, we're all perfect the way we are, but to think that somebody is more perfect or better or smarter, it's we're who we are and we need to enjoy it. And I'm digressing, I know, but we really need to appreciate the beauty that is within us and and revel in our own bodies. You know, we all think we're you know, we're too fat, we're too skinny, we don't have enough curves, you know, somebody's always pretty. There's always going to be somebody physically better looking or than you. There's always going to be somebody more intelligent. It doesn't matter. You're where you are right now because that's where you need to be and that's where you can do the most good. And that's what, where your soul has chosen for you to be. So you're at the right place. And even when you screw up, it's okay. Sometimes we don't learn. If everything were going smoothly, we'd never learn. You learn from your screw ups and from your mistakes. That's how I've learned everything I've learned is by taking a wrong turn or, or making a mistake. I'm not encouraging you to just do it on purpose. But Again, don't beat yourself up over it because it's just it's just a little detour. You end up back where you need to be in the long run if you just trust and, and believe. You really do. I had another incident where we went up skiing with these elders and I was married before and it was really, oh God, it was an overcast day. You couldn't even see, you know, the bottom of the mountain and it was icy and uh, we'd been up skiing and I was a really good skier. I used to ski the black moguls even and the black diamonds and Linda said, um, hey, she said, why do we let the guys go up on last one last round and let's go get a cup of hot chocolate and sit by the fire? And I thought, oh, God, that sounds so good. I was freezing. And I mentioned it to, to my husband. And he said, no, he goes, you, we need to go up on la one last run. He said, you know, and get more bang for our money. We paid a lot of money for these all day passes. And so I didn't want to go up. I really I really felt that I needed to go stay in the lodge because I was freezing. I was uncomfortable. I wasn't having a good time, but I didn't want to have an argument with my husband and how the other elders see us arguing, you know? So I just went up. I hit this piece of black ice. I know better, but I hit this piece of black ice and I locked my knees and I fell <laughs> And I did the most beautiful flip that you, I mean, you would have thought maybe <laughs> for the Olympics. I mean, I just did this full flip and it was very impressive, except that I landed on my face. <laughs> and I think I remember thinking, oh, this is too much pain for me to handle. And I think I blacked out for a while because when I opened my eyes, I was going really fast down this hill headed towards this little boy who was like right on the edge of the hill. And if I would have hit him, he would have fallen over. And so I'm digging in my fingernails, trying to stop and digging in my my heels. And I stopped right before him and I sat up and I went, oh, I think I just broke my whole face. And I didn't realize at the time that my face looked like a monster, you know, the, the rug burns or whatever. The little boy looked up at me, he quit crying, and he went skiing down the hill calling his mom. <laughs> it's like a cartoon. Yeah, it really was like a cartoon. And then my husband thought I was going to have to, you know, go down in a, one of those body bags. And I, I didn't want to do that. Um, so I slid all the way down on my rear when we got to the what is it, the first aid station or what they have down there, um, they, I mean, the look on their faces. And when I looked in the mirror, my eye looked like it was hanging out of the socket. It wasn't, but, and my face was all swollen. I mean, I looked mangled. And then later when we came back. Guys, you should know, though, that Nancy has healed perfectly. Totally, totally beautiful massage now. Oh, thank you. Well, I went, actually, what happened, when I went to the doctor, of course, they thought my husband had beat me and they wanted me to sit down and talk, you know, because I looked like I'd been beaten up. But the whole thing of it, you know, he said that actually um, I got a free, uh, I think it was like a $5,000 because 
it's, he said, people pay for this. The doctor was teasing me that people pay for skin abrasions or something like that. He said, it had just, you know, so it had taken the last layer of skin off my face and, you know, I was going to be more youthful. <laughs> so I don't know, <laughs> as a silver lining, the sad thing about it is the same, the next year, the very next year, chance I did the same damn thing. We were on the same mountain with the same elders of the church and it was a cloudy day and we were on a, we weren't even on a black. We were, you know, it was a blue black slope that we were on. And Tim said, nope, we're going to go up for one more run. And my spirit guides were screaming at me to get the hell off of that mountain. Honestly, I mean, it was just, and I went up and that year I got taken down in a body bag. I couldn't slide down. I couldn't, I was in a brace for six months, clear up to my waist. So that's what I'm saying about don't let other people make your decisions for you. Tim didn't have to suffer. I did. I had to be in that brace. He didn't have to. And a big lesson from that too, I just wanted to interject is something that I was really realizing is that you are like making this decision because you want to not inconvenience other people or something. But then once you get yourself all messed up, then you have to depend on them way more than you would have before. And that actually becomes your fear becomes reality more dramatically. So, yeah. And that, uh, that's really true. I mean, we, we, we create our own reality. I really believe that. I mean, I think that we do have contracts and we really want to, our soul really wants to follow those contracts. But even that, if you decide to, to renege, I mean, it's your free will, but and, you know, eventually you're going to have to come back and learn the lessons that you need to learn, that your soul knew it needed to learn. And I think that's what we're all here. We're all just, there's a song, walking each other home. And I think that's what we're all here. We're all connected. We're all helping each other. You know, I think that when you look into the eyes of another person, you're seeing a reflection of yourself. There was a game we played in psychology about what do you really hate about? that somebody else does? What is it that just just drives you crazy that this person that you just, you know, you judge and what is this other person doing? And it's the same thing that you do, but you don't see it. And that's why it's so clear. It's we hold up a mirror to each other. And that's why relationships are so hard because you have to look at yourself. Any relationship you're in, especially intimate relationships, you know, you have to look at yourself. And it's like, you know, the emperor that wore no clothes. He thought he had this magnificent wardrobe and was so proud and everybody could see. But nobody told him. They let him walk out there naked and make a fool out of himself. A good friend would have said something. A good friend would have said you know, you don't have a bunch of clothes. You're naked, you know. I remember my psychology professor said, and that a good friend is somebody who will tell you if you have spinach in your teeth. You know, he said, if you're going to do a presentation or a talk, you know, you're standing up before the class or something and you've had salad and you got spinach in your teeth. People will let you stand up and make a fool out of yourself because they're embarrassed to tell you that you have spinach in your teeth because you might react negatively to them. But a good friend will tell you, you know, a good friend will tell you if your fly is down, <laughs> you know, you have to help each other out because our shortcomings and stuff they they stand out like neon lights to other people but we are oblivious sometimes we have to go through the same mistakes repeat the same lessons many many times before we find out what we're doing wrong it almost seems like time is not at all linear like we think and actually we're on a big wheel going around and our position on the wheel whether it's closer to the inside and to the middle or to the outside is kind of determining what parts of the uh, cycle that we're going through. It sounds like if you're stuck in the same place, the next year you might actually have the exact same thing happen to you in the exact same way. And I can actually tell you from experience too that that's happened to me. Not ex- not the way that happened with skiing and getting hurt, but I have actually noticed and experienced the same type of conversation with the same person in the same place a year later. And I've, I've caught that happening more than once. And it's very bizarre if you think that this is all just a bunch of uh, molecules bouncing off of each other, creating a random chain of events that goes from the Big Bang all up to now. But if you look at it as a cyclical song that we're going through and changing as we go, 
to, and that's what changes what's happening is us changing rather than the world happening to us. And that's what changes us. Does that make sense? Like we're changing the experiences by changing yourself. And that's what's giving us the experience of time. But the time itself is not really a, a physical construct that we're going through. Anyway, that's kind of how I interpret what, <laughs> what, why we get these repetitions. And of course, it's all just sort of like metaphysical speculation, but it does help to sort of not be freaked out about the concept of eternity to realize you're already in eternity. This is eternity. This is heaven and earth right here. You can make it heaven. You can make it hell. It's your choice, you know. And I, it's kind of like, um, what was that movie, Groundhog Day, where he had to repeat the same thing over and over again until he could get out of it? Yeah, I think that happens a lot. It's, I think that life is kind of like going to school. You have to, you're, you're born into your family and you're totally reliant on them for food, for everything. You can't even go to preschool or kindergarten or whatever until you can feed yourself, until you can wipe your own butt. Then you go and and you go to school and when you've graduated from preschool, I guess you go to kindergarten and then you can go to elementary school and then you go on to junior high and you think, wow, you're really you're really big. You know, you know, all the answers and everything. And then you go into high school. But it's not like you don't just go into school and take one class. You take a lot of different classes. And each class is compartmentalized. It has a lot of different classes in, in and of itself. Say you're taking an English class. It's not just about the vowels and all this other stuff. Sometimes you learn about literature. You learn about all this other stuff. And it's the same with us. And we learn a lot faster in some areas than we do in others. And sometimes we have to repeat the class again because we didn't get it all. But we move along at the pace that's best for us. And I think that's life. So if you have to revisit a lesson or go through it again, I mean, just do it. Learn the lesson the way it's supposed to be learned instead of trying to just hurry through it and rush through it and, and doing it wrong. Like I said before, there's really no right or wrong way. But just with me, I'm like, I've been like the queen of the two by four. You have to hit me over the head before I get the message. And there's an easy way to do it. And there's a hard way to do it. Why keep taking the hard way? Just take the easy way. <laughs> But we thank you for taking the hard way because those examples are really loud and clear for us to check out whenever we read your book or hear you talk about. And it takes a lot of bravery to be like, OK, in this lifetime, at some point, I'm going to explode my entire knee out of it, out of my skin. Like most people do not agree to that and they don't do it. <laughs> so thank you for living a more heightened challenge in, in a lot of areas of your life so that we can see perspective wise that our stuff is possibly not even that bad or at least it couldn't really be worse so if you can survive and be this positive and loving towards yourself and others then we all can and now that we we're kind of at the end of the free show here though so i need you to go ahead and let people know where they can find you online how you'd like them to get in touch and what what you might be able to do for them you know give your website and what other places you might have for them and thank you. Thank you for this wonderful first hour of the conversation. <laughs> thank you. You can reach me at my webpage is www.choices. And it's a dash, not a hyphen. People keep saying they can't reach me, but it's it's a dash, not a hyphen. NLB, my initials, dot com. Again, that's choices dash NLB dot com. If you wanted to text me, I can give you my cell phone number, but I don't get cell coverage on the island. And so I only check my text messages sporadically. It's 303-842-6508. 303-842-6508. And when people want to reach me for a reading, they usually get on my web page and they send me a message and then I get it to respond to them for that. So, yeah, I'd love to hear from you. The book Choices, um, you can get it from Amazon. is probably the cheapest way to get it. Barnes & Noble or Balboa Press. So I can send you a copy too, but I live on an island and it will take 
a lot of postage to send a priority mail. So you're better off getting it from one of these other sources. And thank you for listening today. And I just hope you have a wonderful life. (laughs) Make it a wonderful life. (laughs) Absolutely. It's all about choices we make. All right. Thanks, guys. And we'll see our Plus members on the other side of this break for the excellent Plus extension we're about to get into. Spirit of Socrates, my friends, we've done it again. Another episode is down and it does feel good. I really enjoy talking with Nancy Byrne and I appreciate everything that she's gone through. Wow, what a crazy story. In some ways, it kind of pairs nicely with our episode last week with Charles and Desiree Fultz where we talked about relationships because this episode has a lot to do with your relationship to your true self. And also with your relationship with others that might be not positive relationships or constructive or to your best evolution. So with last week's episode, you kind of get an example of how a constructive and conscious relationship should look. And in this episode, you get some real examples of times when Nancy was not in a good type of relationship and what the consequences for her ignoring her own intuition about what she needed or what was right for her. Those were big consequences sometimes. So I've got to thank her for coming on and sharing her story so honestly and fearlessly. The book is a lot like that as well, just completely viciously honest in some capacities. And I know that she's been through more than a lot of people have ever even cared to imagine going through. So thank her. If you ever do see her online, send her an email or something. Also, thank you to Wisdom Traders. My good friend David Duncan, the man behind the music called Wisdom Traders, which you can find in the show notes link there or on SoundCloud, Wisdom Traders is one word. He sent me a song he was working on and I thought, wow, that would really go nicely with something I've been wanting to do, which is to just sort of create a intro speech type bumper thing that I can use every time for a while instead of having to just play random music. I love playing random music for you guys, and I'm going to keep putting that into the show, I'm sure. But having something consistent that maybe can get into your guys' heads a little bit, like a magical sigil, like a positive jingle, something that maybe you'll hear and remember this is what you're doing, get you in the zone. I don't know. I just think it's time to do something different. And although we did let one episode in 2019 get out without this new intro, the rest of the year, I'm going to be trying this out or something like it, and maybe we'll revisit creating something different around the time we get to 2020. Also, I would like to thank a listener to the show who just recently left us a review on iTunes. The reviewer was Dirtworker17. This was back in December, and they wrote, thanks for doing this and creating such a beautiful ripple into the universe, and thank you for writing that review, I'll remind everybody listening that a good way to help the podcast get to more people without having to actually spend any of your hard-earned money on supporting the show is to go to the iTunes podcast app and search for Interverse. Even if you're already subscribed, go and search for the podcast in the show search area. Once you pull it up, you will be able to see the place where reviews can be left. Look for the stars. Click on that. Leave a five-star review. If you're feeling extra nice, even write something that other people can see that will really let them know that you love this show. And I'll read your review on here as a way of saying thanks, because it does mean a lot. 
and hopefully it helps other people realize that this is what they want to be checking out. Because when you look into the eyes of another, you're seeing a reflection of yourself. That was probably my favorite thing that Nancy said. Of course, I've thought that before, but it's so true. Everything that we see in other people, those are all qualities that are inside of us. We've got it all. We're infinite. And it really does help to keep yourself constantly aware of that. The religious or spiritual idea of remembering God or being in connection with God, there's sort of a cultural confusion about this. Like you're somehow supposed to be subservient or subjugated by an all-powerful, spiritual, invisible entity that you're a servant to. And it doesn't really work like that. Actually, remembering spirit is just as simple as realizing that everybody around you is equally infinite, valuable, and perfect as you are, (laughs) even if they're not acting in a way that is perfectly harmonious. There's some reason for that, and healing can be found. You can push past the evil, push past the judgment of a person as evil and get straight to the healing. And that especially goes for your relationship with yourself. And getting over judgmental mindsets was a big part of the plus extension. If you don't know about Interverse Plus yet, let me tell you real quick. You can sign up on patreon.com forward slash Interverse or look up Interverse on Patreon or find the link in the show notes where by signing up to become a member, You'll get access to early episode releases, but better than that, you'll get two hour long podcast episodes and the entire archive of already released plus episodes that are double long in this plus extension with Nancy. We talked about miracles while herding kids in hailstorms, signs and direct contact from source in the darkest corner of life's experiences. We talked about learning to love your own self for all your worth. War stories from when she worked at the Rape Crisis Center and talked about spiritual protection for the virtuous. Getting Reiki from a tree to escape being lost in the woods, that was a really good story. And becoming friends with your higher spirit, healing from judgmental mindsets, like I said. And we talked about soul contracts and pre-birth agreements that we might make with other people before life. All in all, a very well-rounded and interesting discussion complete with more stories from Nancy that will blow your mind. I'm sure that you are already kind of shocked at some of the stuff that she mentioned in the free show. I don't even want to say it. Getting raped by your dad, that is just crazy. But look, here she is, happy, positive, loving. So even the most horrific stuff doesn't have to define you. Although, in a way, it will define you in that you will use that trauma as part of your own fuel for being powerful sure but nancy and i could have easily had a conversation where we didn't talk about her trauma it doesn't have to be the only thing that she's about of course it's just something that comes up because it's part of her book and i do think that it's as an example the things that she's gone through are very helpful and powerful to know about at least from the correct perspective so thanks for listening I do hope that you consider supporting the show on Patreon. Really could use some new patrons right about now. (laughs) I mean, I'm going to keep doing this even if nobody signs up, but I hate having content that's great the second hour be locked and barred away from most of the people that are listening just because they haven't signed up yet. And I understand if you don't want to mess with Patreon itself, but it is a really easy application. It's not hard to use at all. If you have any questions about how to get your Plus feed working, you can always let me know, but it is easy. You sign up for Plus on Patreon. You get a code. It's the URL link. You copy and paste that into your podcast player of choice as a new station, and boom, you've got Interverse Plus right there alongside the Interverse Free Show. And there's something I do want to get going sooner than later, which is the ability to have you guys sign up directly to my website. But that's not exactly the easiest challenge to figure out as far as building that out, setting it up, at least with the budget I've got. If anybody listening has any advice or is really good at WordPress and wants to work together on that one with me, because I don't use WordPress as a website tool very often, please reach out. (laughs) I'd I'd like some advice. And if not, just say a little prayer to the universal cosmic creator consciousness that we can get plus as a separate standalone service outside of Patreon, because that is a big goal 
of mine that I've got to get figured out this year. I just know I will, but kind of not sure how right now. So thanks for listening. Speaking of plus, I'm going to play you guys out with the beginning of the plus conversation and I'll kind of trail it off just as a little teaser for you. If you are already on plus, I'm not going to do that because you already heard it. Anyway, thanks for listening. Love you guys very much. I will be back soon. I've got a lot of episodes coming up. Very excited for what's in store. Interverse 2019, biggest year yet. You guys are awesome. Peace. I went over there and I got out and I said, what are you two girls doing outside in the hail light and a lightning storm? Get in this house right now. The little one, she puts her hands on her hips, you know, and she didn't say anything, but the message was, you're not my mommy. You don't tell me what to do. And, you know, she, she was crying and she's like, our daddy could be so sad. We got to help our daddy. And I said, where is your mom? And the older one said, she's visiting Connie. She'll be right back. And I said, please get in the house. You could be hurt out here. And the little one's just like, we got to help our daddy pick up the poles. And I said, okay, please, if you just get in the house, I would pick up all the poles for you. I promise. And I'll put them on the side of the house. Okay. Please don't come out again until your mommy gets home. Okay. Do you promise? And the little one shaking her head. I think the big one was really relieved because she's pulling the little one in. And so I picked up all the poles from that, you know, the big poles. So I went inside and it started hailing. And then within a matter of minutes, we had like almost six to eight inches of golf sized hail stones in our on our back deck. And I looked out the window chance and there were those little girls skin and they're still picking up the, trying to look around, walking to find something that I may have missed or something. And without thinking, I just screamed. I said, I command you to stop this storm now. And the storm stopped. And then I'm like, I respectfully thank you for stopping this storm. And the spirit said, Nancy, you are the hand of God. You are all the hand of God. I need you more than you need me. I am spirit. No one can hear me. No one can touch me. No one can see me. But you are here in flesh and blood bodies. You can communicate with each other. You can help each other. If I were to wipe the eyes from a child, I cannot physically.